It's the tipping point in the Kansas City Chiefs season. They are ready for the second half. This is where they cross over the bye week to get ready for what comes next. Welcome to Locked On Chiefs. From the land of the free and the home of the Chiefs, this is the Locked On Chiefs podcast. Friends and neighbors, thanks for making us your first listen here on Locked On Chiefs, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day for free on every platform, everywhere, whether it's here on YouTube where you can like, sub, and hit that bell, or on Spotify or Apple or anywhere you get podcasts. We're here for you five days a week plus some. You every dayers already know that, and you can get a little bit more on the text line at 816, I'm sorry, 913-357-8784. And then you can also get more information uh, at 816-357-8781. Let me say that again, Slower. You can also get everything that you want here because we are crossing over the season today. Normally, you're going to get a guest host here, and I'm going to play the part of the guest host today. Uh, but we're crossing over where the Chiefs have been to where they're going to go. And we are brought to you today, like every Thursday, by our friends at uh, Prize Picks for every crossover episode. The easiest and most exciting way to play Dan- daily fantasy sports right now. You can go to prizepicks.com slash locked on NFL. And use our code all in the lowercase locked on NFL, and you get your first deposit match up to 100 bucks. A lot to cover here about what are the weapons going to look like. That's coming up later in the show. Patrick Mahomes, where is he going from this point? Coming up here in a little bit, what we have to start at where have they gone? What have they been? And what does this offense look like so far in the first half of the 2023 season? Very different than I expected to be off the base. Where are you? No, it's a very different. And, you know, I actually wrote an article about this on Chiefs Corner the other day, looking at the offense and the defense compared to where they were this time last year. Uh, their scoring is down a full touchdown. Um, that's not surprising to anybody. The yards are down a little bit from last year. But one of the things that really sticks out to me is when you start looking at stats and you start looking across the league, it's not just Kansas City. Like, you have good teams that are scoring a lot of points at, at times. But then you also have a situation where, like specifically Miami, against winning teams, they've scored 17 points a game. Against bad teams, it's 39 points a game. Obviously, they have a 70-point differential with Denver or 70-point game with Denver. That's a little bit different. But, you know, you're looking at a situation where there is just a ton of uh, teams that have scoring that's down this season compared to where it has been in the past several years. And a lot of that is the way the defense is focused, the way the defense is playing different uh, schemes and trying to attack the offense. Yeah, it all, it all comes down to what you see versus what you can do to exploit it. And I think that's kind of the ongoing thing here. The only difference is you don't quite have the same capability as you have in years past, um, specifically to the, the experience level. We're going to talk about that later in the show here, folks. But what were some of your takeaways as, as you did this research? Well, the biggest takeaway, like I said, scoring is down a, a touchdown a year. But, uh, you know, on the other side of it, uh, defensive scoring is da- is up a touchdown. So they almost break even. Uh, it's not quite there, but it is really close. So at that point, you're looking at a situation where Kansas City just isn't going to score the same amount of points. And what's going to be really curious is I obviously don't know what's going to happen the rest of 2023. We can kind of surmise what we think will happen. But if you look back at 2022, scoring went down for Kansas City in the second half of the season. Uh, as weather got colder, uh, as they continue to adjust, maybe their you know their defense would continue to uh, can continue to play well on defense. I think that they're going to continue to adapt on offense. Uh, but overall, like I said, scoring's down in the NFL, and I think that it's it's just going to be something that they're going to have to figure out. And I think offenses are going to figure it out eventually against what the defenses are doing. But the NFL is all about scoring, so you know it's going to get changed back at some point. Yeah, I mean, it is a league-wide phenomenon. It's not just the Kansas City Chiefs. And it's interesting that you tied in the defensive scoring part of it. So that means that there are more, not just mistakes on offense, but mistakes to lead to defensive scoring. And that's really interesting because in the, in the net, you're getting about the same point output, I would guess. If, if the offense is down seven and the defense is up seven, you know, you're, you're breaking about even, but it's definitely coming in a different way. And probably the Chiefs are no better example than anything here in that the defense has really surged. They have put up points on, on, on to the board as well as set the offense up for some easy scores. And that makes a lot of sense, but I don't know that that's true across the whole league. So there's a bigger yeah. phenomenon slowing down offenses across the whole landscape. 
No, and you're absolutely right. That is definitely something that's going on. You know, the the advent of, and not necessarily the advent, but using more cover two, cover three, cover four, keeping the safeties back, not allowing big plays over the top, uh, all the different things that the defenses are doing this year. They, they've done some in the past, but they're doing even more so uh, this year than they have in the past. And then you're also looking at a situation where uh, defensive coordinators have, have just figured out this is how we slow down some of the stuff that the offense is doing. And, you know, you keep things in front of them. You don't necessarily attack. You don't necessarily blitz as much. There's some defensive coordinators that are still blitzing a ton, but a lot are just sitting back in coverage. And when you sit back in coverage, you're generally going to probably win more than you're going to lose because you have more guys out in coverage than the offensive team does, generally speaking. Yeah, it, it does make it a little bit easier, and, and I can understand that. It goes hat in hand, but how do they make that adjustment, and is it all on Mahomes? That's going to be my question, and we're going to take a look at what his help, his weapons need to do, as well as where does he go next because my base feeling is that he hasn't quite been himself this entire season to this point, and there's got to be a turnaround at the quarterback level maybe to begin with. Yeah, and I do think you're right in that. I think that there are some things that we need to talk about when it comes to him, what he needs to do. Uh, and I was actually just having a conversation with somebody earlier today about this specific in instance. He needs to learn to do things a little bit different than what he's doing them right now. We all love the, his improvisation skills, his ability to you know keep plays going and keep options open down the field. That's fantastic. But I think in some instances you can see – places where him not taking a check down or him, you know, deciding to throw a deep ball instead of, you know, maybe looking a little bit shorter is costing this team first downs is costing this team drives. And that's really hurting them at times. Yeah. Uh, that's where it all comes in handy. Well, what does he do to correct that? And where does he go next? The quarterback in particular, we're going to get to that on the backside of this but first, uh, you know, you guys might be getting hungry out there. <laughs> and I want to talk to you about our friends over at DoorDash and if you're in Kansas City and you're getting ready to, you know, prepare for a game, obviously Kansas City doesn't play this week. They're on their bye week. But there's going to be a lot of good football going on this weekend. And maybe you want some pizza uh, or some boneless wings. Lots of different things you can get from Johnny's Tavern. Go check Johnny's Tavern out. You can get some delicious pizza, uh, chicken strip platter, all of it delivered directly to your door, whether it's mac and cheese, nachos, wings, whatever you're really looking for, Johnny's can have it delivered to you. And – what I love about DoorDash is it delivers right to your door. You can order it right before the game starts. They can have it delivered during the game. And you can sit there and you can just enjoy watching football all day long. Uh, it's one of the things I love about Sundays right now is having football from basically this is the last week, but it'll be 8.30 to about 9 o'clock or no, 11 o'clock central time at least. Uh, so be able, be sure to check that out. Get up to 50% off up to a $10 value when you spend $15 or more on your first order when you download the DoorDash app and enter code LOCK23, subject to change, terms do apply. Again, that's 50% off up to a $10 value when you spend $15 or more on your first order. When you download the DoorDash app and enter code LOCK23, subject to change, terms do apply. I have terms, I'm going to tell you that. <laughs> you always and, have terms. And, and I'm always excited about some of them. Big area of conversation is time to throw this year um, versus others. But I I'm, I know what I've seen and what I've researched on that, but I want to know what your conclusions are. Uh, and I know you put this together in, in a visual form on Chiefs Corner, but walk me through what are the big takeaways that, that you see in where Patrick is and what he has to do to then evolve here after the bye? Well, I mean, it's, this goes back to kind of what we talked about before is, you know, just take some of the stuff that the defenses are giving you. Uh, maybe you're not going to get first downs. Maybe you're going to end up getting a, you know, going from third and nine to a fourth and two. But at that point, you're in a situation where maybe Andy Reid looks at it and says, okay, well, we're fourth and two. We can afford to go for a fourth and two, but we're not going to go for fourth and nine. So you have the opportunity there to possibly go for an extra down and keep the drive alive. That is a possibility. But the third and nine example to MVS this past week is a perfect example of one of the things that Holmes needs to figure out that he doesn't need to be taking those shots. I want him to be able to throw downfield at times. I think that he should throw downfield at times. Uh, but throwing a jump ball to somebody like MBS who doesn't have that skill set uh, in that scenario where it's a third and nine and you're basically giving up having any chance at going forward on fourth down, I don't think that's the right call. Rasheed Rice was open. He probably doesn't get a first down. But, again, you're closer to the 40-yard line, I believe, 
if he catches the ball and then the, at that point maybe Reed looks at it and says, okay, uh, maybe we can go for it on fourth down. And maybe they kick a field goal. Butker's had a very strong leg and has been able to kick from distance this season and has been very good. So you could be leaving points on the board in, in that scenario. Well, on a side note on Bucker in particular, uh, without the injury, he's been he's been a lot steadier. So I, I think that leads towards, yeah, be, being able to take that risk because you do have that leg that uh, hasn't had any qualifications this year. You know what I mean? Yeah, he hasn't missed anything. And that's honestly, that's phenomenal for what he's been able to do and, and the way he's able to do it. Uh, I've loved what I've seen from Bucker this year. And it's going to be fun to see what he can do for the rest of the season. And you bring up the Chiefs corner website or the Chiefs corner article. This is what it was: Mahomes passing in 2022 versus the bye week. Now, the interesting thing to me, and I get into this here a little bit later. I actually wrote about the about him after the first four weeks. This mm -hmm. is after five, this is after the bye week, so after another five. So now he's got nine games in. Uh, one of the things that stood out to me after four weeks was he was only about 100 yards off of where he was last year in passing. And you think about where he ended up last year. He ended up at 52-50, uh, I believe, or right around 52-50 in yards last season. He was at 1,000 yards this year. He was 11.06 last year. He's only 25 yards off the pace. So at that point, you're thinking, okay, well, maybe he can get to 5,000 yards. Well, at this point, he slowed down. And that's probably not going to be something that's going to be attainable the rest of the season, mostly because you're looking at scenarios where he's not going to be throwing for 400 yards in most games. And the other scenario that, that needs to be talked about, if you're looking at just a stats perspective, is Kansas City doesn't necessarily have to do what he had to do last year. Their defense allowing only, you know, what, 15 point, what is it, 15 points a game right now? Something like that mm -hmm. is not going to cause them to need to score 30, 40 points just to be able to keep up with the other team. Their defense is, is keeping them in games with the score low. So it's possible Mahomes isn't going to throw for as many yards as he did last year. That's fine. Uh, but the bigger story that really you get into here uh, is, well, let's back up for a second. Kansas City 7-2. They were 7-2 at the same time last year. So that's kind of a wash. Uh, they only lost one game the rest of the season after this point last year. That's going to be a tough challenge. And we're going to talk about that probably in the coming days. Uh, and maybe in the next couple of days, we'll talk about uh, what we think that they're you know, their prerogative and where they can get this year season wise and in record wise is going to be, but they have the bills left. They have the Cincinnati Bengals Raiders times two, the chargers, and they have the Eagles coming up next week. So that's going to be a tall task to only lose one of those games, but then you get into it yards per attempt down almost a yard this season per last year. He's got 30 less attempts than he had last year at the same time. Uh, that's playing into the yardage. Obviously yards per attempt is playing into it which means he's throwing shorter than he was last season. Um, and that's going to be a big question. But the interesting part of it is that his completion percentage is actually up. So he's being more efficient, but he's throwing for less yards. And that's that's where it comes out down to. And efficiency is good. Moving the ball is better when it comes down to it. 52-50, um, that sounds like a Van Halen record, by the way. Um, I, I agree <laughs> with you. I don't know that that's uh, attainable, to tell you the truth. But I don't think that it matters. In, in what is right now, and even though you mentioned the Bills and the Bengals, those are two matchups that I, I do agree are formidable ones down the stretch. They're knocked down, a, 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 I don't know a nice way to say it, but they're not functioning as high uh, in the offensive output as they did last year as well. So even though it appears as though it's lagging behind, the whole league is. And so relatively, I think, um, let's give Joe Burrow credit. He's res responded from the calf injury. Uh, it is going to be the challenge that we thought it might be uh, in the preseason that maybe we thought we'd get away from uh, in the early season. I think it is going to round into that. But that's going to be the test for me. That's The, the matchups against the elite quarterbacks is what are going to be I think the the high watermark for Patrick Mahomes. So can he raise his game to that level? Like you said, uh, 0. 0.7 yards per attempt. That is a giant chunk. The fact that it's 25 yards a game, uh, I think that's made up for so the differential is made up for in in the yak and what happens with those. But the 0. 0.7 per attempt, I think, is a significant thing that maybe we start to see as guys understand route combinations better. They use them better. I think we're going to see – we better see a dispensing of, of all this uh, trickery behind the line, uh, short of the line to gain, short of the line 
of scrimmage type plays and just be more deliberately attacking downfield. And I think that will solve where Patrick's numbers are right now. Well, and it's it was 25 yards per game after four games. Right now, it's closer to 50 yards, maybe even 55 yards. Uh, he's down. So he's not going to be on pace to where he was last year. I don't think he has a chance at making 5,000 this year uh, unless things go completely different than I'm expecting in the second half of the season uh, with the defense not being able to put points or not being able to stop all the other offenses. And then that's a different story. Uh, but the other thing that really stands out to me, and this is where it got interesting to me as well, 17 TDs this year compared to 25 the same last season. That is a TD a game. That is literally what we were talking about when you look at the offense. They're down a TD a game. It's basically based on his uh, on him having one TD less a game than he had this time last season. And then the other big issue, and this is, I think, something that is getting overlooked a little bit. Uh, seven IT, INTs last year after nine games. This year he has eight, which – doesn't seem like it's a big deal, except for that you also add in two fumbles. And that, you know, you start getting to 10, 10 turnovers. That's 10 lost possessions. That's 10 lost chances to score points. And the fumble against uh, the Miami Dolphins was down in Kansas City's territory. And the fumble early in the season was, I believe, also in Kansas City's territory. So he's losing the ball close to the goal line, which is putting his defense in a bad situation to try to stop him. Uh, there's some great stats out there that shows that this defense isn't one that will have a ton of three and outs, but they're somebody that will slow offenses down. Like if you give them, you know, maybe, maybe the D offense will get two or three first downs, but it's the fact that they will not, they will continue to produce and they will continue to stop people. Uh, when you're looking at, you know, the third or fourth or fifth, or maybe even the eighth or ninth play, they will start the offenses cannot continue to be perfect, which is what it takes to beat this defense right now. Yeah, that's very, very true. And we have to build into the fact that Patrick was was ill during the Denver Broncos game, uh, the last one. And so that that's part of it. But how does he rebound from that? What can he do? I, I do expect a surge, whether it's, it's due to just what we're going to talk about next and the weapons that are receiving passes from him. Uh, and hopefully making more uh, options for him to throw the ball, or whether it is that illness. And illness is at the top of my my thoughts right now because we do spend a lot of time together, and I want to tell you about our friends that are going to help you get what you need uh, when you feel an illness coming on. And, uh, I get fired up about the wins and losses. You guys know that, about the run game and about what Andy likes to call versus what's executed. And uh, we're we're thankful to have that connection with you guys, and thank you for subscribing to the show and being here for us. And I want to chat about... Uh, what else I'm thankful for. And it doesn't matter whether you're on an extended travel vacation or or there's some kind of weather thing coming. Uh, sometimes supplies are in short demand, in short supply, and you need to get yourself covered. And we're here to help you. Thanks to our partners at Jake's Medical. Life-saving antibiotics and a long list of medications can be ordered in a year supply so that you have them on hand and you're ready to go. All you have to do is go over right now to jakesmedical.com and you're going to receive a 12-month supply of stuff in a handy little bag that is your kit to move on with. Uh, you use the promo code Locked On right now at checkout, and you get a hefty discount as well. It's a 12-month supply daily medication, and a very good customer uh, had this to say about Jace. I'm thankful for the service. The supply chain issues uh, caused me to cut pills in half and have to ration myself. Uh, I ordered most of my daily meds on a one-year supply, and this uh, is also an antibiotic kit. So I feel secure now. Prices are lower than local pharmacies, and I highly recommend this to everyone. That's the kind of reactions we're getting off of Jake's Medical. So if you or someone you love wants a peace of mind, uh, whether you're traveling or having a, a year supply of medication on hand, you can go to jakesmedical.com and see it for yourself, and it's offered right now. Remember to use the promo code Locked On to get $20 off your purchase right now at jakesmedical.com. I wish I had had some of that. When Patrick came down with the flu the night before that Denver game, uh, maybe that would have helped. But you know, it's retrospect. So how do you how do, how do you prep him for the rest of the season in doing something similar and making sure that he doesn't get sick anymore? We are into the winter. In fact, as we speak, it's snowing at my place. So there's a lot going on out here to get him ready. And I think it comes down to who he's throwing to. We've seen him, and and I go back to the time to throw thing. Everyone's uh, been quoting it as 
this grandiose measurement of the offensive line and kudos to the offensive line. But Patrick's getting that point because he refuses to pull the trigger earlier than that when the line is holding together even more solidly. And so by running up this time to throw, it's actually hurting the fact uh, and giving him uh, pressure in his face at the end where he's missed throwing things, he's overthrowing guys. I think that's got to be it. The timing's got to come back to this offense, and it's got to start with the wideouts being in the right place at the right time so Patrick can let the ball fly. You bring up protection. I want to just throw this out there really quick, and I wanted to get this in last segment. I apologize. Uh, you look at protection from last year compared to this year. Mahomes has 11 sacks this year versus 16 last year. Uh, that doesn't sound like a huge difference. It's not, but that is something that's moving in the right direction. The interesting part for me, though, is you look at the first part of the season, the first four games, Mahomes was sacked twice, which means in the last five games, he's been sacked nine times, which equates to 2.93% of his dropbacks uh, this season compared to one24 for the first four games. Uh, I've been tracking all of this, so sorry, I, I got all the numbers to throw out there. But the other thing that's telling on this, when you look at the offense, is he's losing on average seven and a half yards per sack. This offense right now is not built to be able to withstand losing that type of yardage. They have in the past been able to convert longer third downs or longer second downs into first downs. But that's not the way that they're playing right now. That plays into all of this, and that also gets into the receiving core. I, I agree with you. The question becomes: How do you, how do you change it, and how how do you settle it down? And I think for me, it's it's just one thing. You have a top three trio that you march out there, and you let them play more. You don't have to freshen them up as much. You don't have to cycle them in as much. You have a fourth guy that is your next go to that gives somebody some relief. Sometimes I personally feel like. That should be Sky Moore. And I, I think it should be MVS Watson and Kadarius Tony that start out there. Rasheed Rice comes in with Sky Moore as the relief. If you're ready to flip Rice into the starting role, I have no problem with that. Um, I, I think he can do a lot of things, and you can let Watson do uh, the MVS role. It doesn't really matter to me what the top three and the main guy that comes off the bench are. It's that there are those three guys. I talked about this on 810 today, and it, it really hit home as I walked them through my, my first impression, just how much that I think this is even more important. So if, if you listen to that, folks, I'm sorry if I underplayed it for you, but let me just say it here. They have to have the power trio that starts the ballgame and can be out there every play with Travis Kelsey if they need to, and then they supplement. I personally think that Kadarius Tony and Rasheed Rice need to be on the field more together. And if that means that they have to start every game and you just have to deal with whatever the, the negatives are, fine. But you got to attack the middle and you got to do it with Tony. That slant last week was a great example of what he can do that he hasn't been doing enough for. So for me, it's take the tarp off the the you know the American muscle, put the, the pedal to the floor and go after it with every single guy. You have enough of them if you have injuries, you can sustain it. But it's got to be aggressive in my mind. I don't disagree with you, and I want to go back really quick to the lost yardage. And the reason I want to go back for just a second, you talk about losing seven and a half yards per sack, but you said something earlier talking about how they were having all these short yardage type throws or behind the line of scrimmage type throws. That is something they need to get away from because if you do not hit on those, you get yourself into a negative position, you get yourself behind the sticks, and that becomes a problem. So I agree with you. I think that they need to have three guys that are their starters. I disagree with you on who it should be. I don't think you want Watson and MBS on the field at the same time. Uh, okay. I personally would prefer if it was Rasheed Rice, Kadarius Tony, and you choose between Watson and, and MBS. Uh, okay. That's personally the way I would look at it um, because that gives you, I, I think that it's, you know, Watson can play on the outside. MBS can play on the outside, obviously. Uh, Rasheed Rice can play on the outside some. Kadarius Tony can play out on the outside some, although both of those guys are better in the slot at times as well. So that's something that you need to take into consideration. But I'm with you. I think that they need to figure out their top three wide receivers. They need to run them. Uh, and I am more of the opinion that it's probably Watson versus MBS because I think he's actually better in contested ball situations, which if you're going to be throwing the ball up in a downfield situation, you want somebody that's going to go attack the ball. He generally is a guy that will do that. MBS doesn't really seem to attack the ball when he's trying to catch it. He lets it get into his body, and that can be a problem on deep balls that, you, that are contested throws. Uh, as far as Kadarius Tony is concerned, I have no idea what they're doing with him. 
Uh, you look at how he, he was used last year when he came in, and it was sparingly at times, but they at least used him. Right now, they're not using him. That's a problem. Get him involved. He get, Look at what he gave you last week, and you're absolutely right. That one play last week, it was a seven-yard slant that he turned into 17 yards. Great. An extra 10 yards doesn't seem like much. Three missed tackles doesn't seem like much. Who cares? I get it. It's one play. But he has the ability to do that kind of stuff. And that's without him getting into space, which he's best at. When he mm-hmm. actually has an opportunity to get into space, that completely changes what he's able to give you on offense. Uh, so in my mind, Kadarius Tony, Rasheed Rice, and I would go Watson as your top three. And personally, I wouldn't be putting Sky Moore in for – uh, uh, well, I wouldn't be putting MBS in unless it's for Justin Watson. Uh, I'd ro- I rotate those that. two. I'd rotate yeah. those two doing about the same thing, and that's fine. If you want to go okay. four wide and you want to put both of them on the field at the same time, okay, fine, I, I guess. But those two play a very similar role in the offense. Uh, yes, they all probably – yes, they know all three positions, but I think that their role and what they're good at is too similar to have them both on the field at the same time on a regular basis. Okay, I can live with that. You convinced me. I was going from the standpoint of give Patrick the, the targets that he trusts. And the, both those guys seem to get those plays. So I just want him to get the engine going. But you make a good point in terms of role. That's very much there. And that also goes into one of my goals. And that is to get Rasheed Rice on the outside predominantly. It's not enough. I think he needs to be a Z at the very most. And he can even line up in the X if you need him to. But get him out of the slot because that's where Kadarius, Tony, and Sky Moore need to eat, in my opinion. I want to see Rasheed Rice out wide. And my issue with MVS and uh, Watson being on the field at the same time, like I said, I think they're too similar. But the other issue that you get into is maybe he trusts them, but it's not like he trusts them enough to throw them five or six balls a game. Like between the two of them, they're not getting five or six balls a game. That's a problem. Watson got they're... five targets last week, didn't he? Yes, but how many? MVS got two. Yeah, fair enough. So you're at seven. You're at seven targets. Between two guys that are that have been usually going to thirty to thirty five snaps a game, if you're not going to throw the ball to him on a regular basis and you're not going to try to force balls into him, and I'm not saying they should, I'm just saying if you're not going to give them the opportunities, you're hamstringing yourself by putting them both out there at the same time. Yeah, fair enough. Um, I, I, I'm with you. I, like, I'm all gas at this point. I, I don't care who it is. Go make plays, whether it's contested catch balls, whether it's getting loose, whether it's in space, go make plays. And those are the guys that I want to feed. And the other, the only thing I would say really quick is if you're going to continue to push the ball downfield, uh, you know, fine, use just Watson, use MBS in that, in that capacity. But please, for whatever you do, if you're going to have Rice on the field for two thirds of the snaps, which you did last week, make it two thirds of the passing snaps as well. Right. Don't just have him on there for half the passing snaps and half rushing snaps. Maybe he's a great blocker, and I get it, but you're wasting the skill set, especially. I mean, in getting him only two targets was was problematic as well, but that's a whole other ball game. I mean, I, I'm even okay with a platoon. If it's Watson, Rice, and Tony as as the, the first line, and then you come back with MVS and Sky and McColl, I'm fine with that too because, uh, you know, McColl's screen work last week was exactly what he needs. So I, I, I don't mean to leave him out, folks. I know a lot of you are probably screaming. You didn't even mention McColl Hartman. You're right. I didn't because, quite frankly, I know what he's capable of. I need to find what the rest of these guys can actually do. And then you pepper McColl on top is the way that my brain thinks. But maybe it just needs to be platoons and, and you get what you can get out of it. I don't know, but it, they've got to find something instead of this constant churning. I don't think that they need platoons. I think they need to get, figure out what they could do with McCole Hardman and use him sparingly, only have him on the field for five or ten snaps a game. Uh, and maybe he's the guy that's running the motion all the time. Maybe he's not a guy that's going to get a ton of targets, but if he is somebody that can set up the motion and run it and do those types of short routes, he's a lot better at that than Kadarius Tony is, and you're not putting Tony in his skill set if you're doing that. The other thing I will say, I loved what they did with Sky Moore last week when they put him in the backfield and they motioned him out. I think that's a smart way to give him the ball. It was quick uh, and gets him open and gives him something he can do very easily and just get upfield. I agree. Doesn't have to be big plays. Just move the ball. Sorry. That's it. (laughs) No. I want big plays, but I understand where you're coming from. Uh, There have been big plays on defense. There's plenty of people that can produce them. Who steps up down the stretch? We're going to talk about that tomorrow. Make sure that you join us. And then it's on to the Eagles. 
Uh, there is a big matchup coming here against these Eagles, and I think that's going to bring out the best of this offense. We're going to talk about it more in depth tomorrow. We hope that you will join us. Make sure that you like and sub and hit that bell here on YouTube and subscribe over on Spotify and Apple or anywhere that you get a podcast. We are free every day for you all the time, at least five days a week. And if you want a little bit more, you can get a little juice at 816-357-8781. Thanks for being with us today. We appreciate your time, and we'll talk to you tomorrow.